The kingdom is more than just, um, you know, a catchphrase. It's more than just a government. When you walk outside of the authority structure that God has set up, that you are actually missing out on a blessing. In order for something to manifest, it has, it has to happen twice. It has to happen in the spirit and in the natural. Join pastor and co-pastor JC and Gina Matthews as they teach the concepts, laws, and principles upon which the kingdom operates. Hi, I'm Dr. JC Matthews. And I'm co-pastor Gina Matthews. And we want to invite you to watch our kingdom teaching program entitled The Embassy, where we teach about the concept, the laws, the principles upon which the kingdom operates. You are not going to want to miss it. We'll see you at the embassy. Welcome and thank you for joining us here at the embassy, your, your source for kingdom teaching. My name is Dr. JC Matthews and I'm here with my wife and co-pastor Gina Matthews. And we want to talk again, as we always do here at the embassy, about the kingdom. Uh, I want to make a statement that uh, may shock some of you, but it will challenge you. Uh, and that statement is, I believe that every believer should be required to attend law school. Amen. That's right. I, I truly believe that. Now, when I went through law school, uh, I had no uh, idea of the correlation that what I was learning would how it would translate uh, into my understanding of the Bible. As a matter of fact, I struggled for many years with why did I go to law school and then afterwards go into ministry and they seemed to be in opposition to one another. I couldn't really use what I had learned in law school and the training that I had there into ministry. But when I received the revelation of the kingdom, I, I saw that the two really were related. That's right. That um, that perspective that I gained in law school really gave me uh, a, an insight into a level of understanding the Bible and the kingdom and the principles that govern the kingdom mm -hmm. um, that really gave me an understanding of the operation of the kingdom. One of the things that we've learned in law school was to ask the question, why? To really understand the underlying foundation of a particular act or thought or in a, a deed. And uh, when we get into the Bible, many times we just accept certain things because we were told uh, that this is thus and so. But then when you take a look at the Bible from another perspective and you start to get below the surface of the vernacular and the vocabulary and the terminology, you really start to discover that there is an order there is, that there is a defined order to everything that God does. God does nothing happenstance. That's right. Everything has a predetermined purpose and it has a predetermined outcome mm -hmm. already uh, uh, ingrained in what it is that he has begun. And he begins and initiates everything by his word. So his word is really the effective agent or the substance of all that there is. We, we see in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, the Bible says that we understand that the word that it created the world in everything that we see was created by the thing that we don't see. don't see. Even faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, how do you get faith? Faith come by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And hearing by the word of God. So every thing that we have is a consequence of the word of God. The word of God is not designed necessarily to make us feel better. That's right. It is necessarily given so that we may have instructions on how to live successfully in life. We mentioned in uh, Deuteronomy 29 and 29 that the, those secret things the Lord has kept to himself. Yes. But those things that he has revealed to us, he has given us so that we may be able to keep his law. And that we may be blessed by, he talks about our generations, our generations being right. able to benefit from what he has said. So when we take a look at the Bible, maybe from a legal perspective, mm -hmm. now I'm not talking about legalism. You know, I'm not talking about uh, trying to um, adhere to a certain um, code of conduct mm -hmm. to justify or to cause our the, the conduct being the the basis for our righteousness. I'm not talking right. about that. I'm talking about recognizing that there is a logic, that there is a law or a fundamental premise yes. upon which God operates towards us. 
we mentioned um, that if you opened up the Bible and you look at the division of the Bible, the Bible is divided into the oh. Old Testament or the Old Covenant, mm -hmm. the New Testament or the New Covenant, and those particular terms have specific legal meaning as it pertains to what it is that is in the covenant or in the testament. That's right. Uh, the covenant generally is given for the purpose of uh, uh, communicating interest in land, and the testament is generally given for the purpose of communicating or property. transferring property. That's right. So immediately when we open up the Bible, re remember we're, we're setting aside our religious uh, pre-connotations or understanding of, of what the Bible is. We're going to look at it for what it is. So originally when we open up the Bible, the first thing that we're presented with from one of the introductory pages is you're about to enter into or have access to a covenant. That's right. A, a transfer of interest in land. Now, the first thing that we see God doing is preparing this land. Um, the Bible says, uh, read Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Okay. Genesis chapter 1, starting at verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. So the first thing we see is, is that uh, God was a creator of the heavens and the earth. And I believe it's in Isaiah 45 and 18. Mm -hmm. It says something to the effect that the, Bible, that the earth was given or was created for the purpose of being inhabited. That's right. So we see in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1, that God created the heavens and the earth. But then we see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, that it was not habitable. That's right. Something took place between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, that caused the earth to be inhabitable. That's another program. Yes, it is. <laughs> but what we do understand is, is that he goes through the process of reforming or, or reconditioning the earth for the purpose of transferring this property to man. Yes. And when he transfers this property to man in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, he gives him something called dominion. Mm -hmm. He gives him authority over territory. Authority over territory is the foundation of what we call a kingdom. Mm -hmm. So God initially gives man not, not a religion. That's right. Because man's first and foremost relationship with God was just that. It was a relationship. Mm -hmm. We, we, we were God's sons. Uh, there was no artificial institution or any other form of, of, of organization That's right. uh, that was in a place outside of the context of his kingdom and his law. As long as we kept his law, we had a right to his benefits. But we see this transfer of right and property. Mm -hmm. So he gives us dominion over, over, over the earth. That's right. Uh, one of the things that I notice when I read Genesis chapter one is, is that God talks about he created the heavens in the, in the sense of the stars, the planet, yeah. the sun, the moon. the moon, all of those types of things does not give us dominion over them. That's right. Therefore, when we go out into space, we, we, we uh, get these uh, mechanical uh, uh, vehicles mm -hmm. and all of this equipment, space suits. space suits, apparatus, just so that we can breathe. You see somebody on the moon, they're really struggling to move. Mm -hmm. And everything that we do is very difficult out there in those environments because we weren't given dominion over them. That's right. But when we exercise and we stay within the confines mm -hmm. of what God has said and conveyed to us, nothing is necessarily impossible. That's right. Nothing is necessarily imp impossible. So when we're talking about a kingdom, when we open up the Bible, the first thing that we are introduced to that God is about to convey property. If, if, if your Bible says Old Testament, then he's about to com convey his property. If it says Old Covenant, he's about to convey land, interest in land to you. And we see that happen in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Likewise, when he gives us land, he gives us instructions. That's right. He says, have dominion, uh, subdue, uh, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, be That's fruitful, right. all of those types of things. And then he gives us some instructions. Yes. If you look at this particular uh, 
these, these passages of scriptures from a religious standpoint, they, they necessarily will not have any impact in your particular life right now. But if you look at them from a standpoint that God has given me instructions on how to have dominion, that he has actually given us insight mm -hmm. into how we be fruitful, how do we multiply, yes. then it becomes very meaningful. Um, one of the things that I wanted to try to uh, do in this particular uh, program is to flesh out what it is that we talk about when we say uh, dominion. Yes. Um, when God gave man dominion, Dominion is sovereign, uh, sovereign authority over territory. Mm -hmm. the, the, the root word of dominion is domain. Mm -hmm. So it's the authority over the domain. That's right. That is what causes a kingdom to be present, the authority over the territory. It's mm -hmm. not, necessarily the ter not necessarily the territory itself. In order to have a kingdom, you have to have territory. That's right. But at the same time, if the authority is removed from that territory, that territory is no longer part of the kingdom. Yes. It does not cease to exist. It's just not part of that kingdom. The authority over the territory causes that territory to qualify as the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Now, that particular understanding applies to the blessing. The blessing is really a jurisdictional issue. When you bless something or you, God has declared that something is blessed, he is saying that that thing is under my jurisdiction. That's right. It really does remove it from the circumstances of the environment mm -hmm. and now subject it to a culture that is, that, that, is, that is established for the purpose of multiplication, for being fruitful, for multiplication, That's right. all of those types of things. The culture of heaven. The culture of heaven. So when we look at these particular terms that we have given a religious understanding to blessing and mm -hmm. um, dominion and, and being fruitful, all of those have a predetermined purpose, and that is to advance the manifestation or the revelation of, of the kingdom in the earth. And that is what we were originally given. Mm -hmm. Now, dominion is, is, is a very um, uh, interesting um, concept mm -hmm. because initially, I want to shout over the fact that I have dominion. Right. But at the same time, it communicates to me certain responsibilities. That's right. That God says that uh, without your participation, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to do certain things for you. That's right. That I've given you. Now, remember this dominion is complete authority over territory. There cannot be two sovereigns over the same territory. That's right. So when God looks from heaven and he's creating this physical universe or this physical planet, this physical kingdom, mm -hmm. and his intention is that this physical kingdom be a representation of his spiritual kingdom. Mm -hmm. That spiritual kingdom is governed by law. So likewise, he institutes inherently within his creation certain laws That's right. so that these particular laws will facilitate and carry out a specific purpose. He turns that particular planet over to human beings and he says that I have created you to represent me That's in right. my image That's right. and I've created you in my likeness to give you the ability to operate like me. We will be in partnership because I'm not necessarily giving you ownership of the planet. That's right. I'm giving you the right to possess and enjoy it. Yes. I'm turning this planet over to you so that you can govern it. First of all, being led by my spirit. Yes. God created man with a place within himself for God to be housed. For our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. God never intended to abandon the planet. He, is, he, he, he intended to... Uh, to rule the planet through the free will of spirit-filled men. That's right. And this was the basis for our dominion. Our dominion was based on our relationship and our ability mm -hmm. to be led by God. Mm -hmm. Now keep this in mind because this is very important. Our ability to be led by God is necessarily dependent upon our knowing what God has said. Yes. And, and also the revelation of his spirit. I want to ask you to do this. Read Genesis chapter uh, 1, verse 26 and 28 through 28. Okay. Starting at verse 26, and God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. 
In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So we see here that God specifically establishes man domi man's dominion over the earth. Now this is, this is very important. If God is to impact the affairs of men in the earth, he must use a man. That's right. He must use a man. Now think about the consequences of this because many times religiously we pray to God, God do this. Mm -hmm. When God is necessarily saying, I cannot do it because I've given you the responsibility of doing it. I've given you authority right. over the particular matters in the earth. If it's going to impact the affairs of men, God has to use a human being. That's right. Uh, one of the things, turn to Exodus chapter three. We'll see this more, more, um, more clearly. This may explain why some of our, our prayers are not being answered. That's right. Uh, we're asking God to do something that he has committed by his word that we're responsible for. It, it necessarily does not mean that God does not care about your situation. God cared enough to give you his law so that's that you know right. ahead of time what the outcome of your actions will be. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's an that's a element of the law or a perspective of law that we have to have. Law, as I mentioned, is not a regiment of restrictions. That's right. It is illumination into your, into your situation. It's instructions on how to do things in a certain way to get a certain outcome. Yes. God has given you the ability to be successful by following his law. That's right. Um, for instance, Joshua chapter 1, verse 7 and 8 tells us to meditate on his word day and night. Don't turn to the left nor to the right. To do his law, and as a result of us meditating on his law, That's right. as a result of what we would do, we will be successful and we will prosper. Uh, Psalms chapter one, um, verses one through three talks about the same thing. Uh, the man who does not stand in, uh, stand in the way of sin or sit in the seat of scorn or so on and so forth or walk with him. It says that he will meditate on the word of God day and night. Mm -hmm. And as a result, his, his leaf will not wither and whatsoever he does shall, shall prosper. prosper. Deuteronomy right. 28. That if you read the whole chapter, it talks about your prosperity, whether or not you receive blessing or cursing is based upon your ability to keep God's law. That's right. So when we talk about uh, the, 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 the reason for law, it's to preserve, to protect, and to be a provision for man's prosperity. Mm -hmm. Now, God has given us a law, and that law is the law of dominion which means that God must use a human being in order to impact the affairs of men in the earth. He gave man dominion so that man had the ability to determine outcomes in the earth, but he's given us his law so that we know ahead of time what the outcome will be. What the outcome will be. That's right. Keep this in mind. If you do God, if you do things God's way, you will get God's results. Mm -hmm. Many times when we hear God say something, we say, wow, that's great. And then we say, that's what I want to happen in my life. The next thing we need to do is find out what God has said on how to cause what he has said to manifest. That's in our right. Life. That's right. So I, uh, Exodus chapter three. Remember uh, my original statement that God has to use a human being. He has to find a yielded vessel That's right. in order for God to become active in that particular activity. Mm -hmm. Your submission gives God access to that particular area of uh, concern because God gave you dominion. Without that submission, without that exercise of your free will, mm -hmm. God has no right to enter into that situation. That's and I'll right. talk about that in a little bit. But we'll see this played out here in Exodus chapter 3. Um, start at verse number uh, 7. Okay. Okay. 7 down to... 7 down to verse number 10. Okay. Starting at verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up out of the land unto a good land, and a large and unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto a place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me. I have also seen 
the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, I want you to keep in mind that God said that I have given man dominion over the earth. It is true that God can do anything, that God can do anything that, uh, uh, that he wants to, That's except right. break his word. That's right. God will keep his word. And one of the things that we try to uh, stress at the International Kingdom Institute is, is that we really have to, uh, to, to, to have an understanding of the underlying foundation That's right. upon which God speaks. Yes. He speaks from the perspective of law. And God is confined by his own word, yes. by his own law. And when God says something, he necessarily at that particular time, when he says it, it's established. That's right. And even God himself will not transgress his word. So when he gave man dominion, complete authority over the affairs of earth, if God wants to impact the affairs of men in the earth, he has to find a yielded vessel. Yes. As I mentioned before. Um, the submission of the will or the free exercise of the will gives God access. It's actually an affirmative affirmation of your will to allow God to become active in that particular situation. That's right. So what happens is God has to find somebody mm -hmm. that will do his will in the earth. That's right. So here we see uh, in verse number seven. Now listen to again. I'm going to highlight some of the things that co-pastor said to draw our, 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 our attention to it. He says, and the Lord says, I have surely seen the afflictions of my people, which are in Egypt. Who saw the, who saw the affliction? God saw. God saw it. And have heard the cry by reason of their task master. Now who heard the cry? God heard the cry. God heard the cry. For I know their sorrows. Now who knows their sorrows? God knows. God knows their sorrows. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of Egyptians. Who came down to deliver them? God came down. Now wait one minute, because God says, I have seen, I have heard, I have come down to deliver. And we go all the way down to verse number 10. Now, therefore, I will send you. That's right. On to Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel out of Egypt. Do you see how God sees his relationship with, with men? He says, it's my will. I've spoken over this situation right. that they would inherit a promised land. Mm -hmm. It's my will that they be delivered from these taskmasters. Mm -hmm. I have come down to deliver them, but I have to find somebody. That's right. Some, some human being who has dominion to impact the affairs or has the legal right to impact the affairs of men in the earth in order for my will to be done. That's right. This is why uh, Jesus says the prayer. He says, listen, he says, God, not my will, but your will be done. He had a will. That's right. He had a free will, a decision on whether or not he would follow through with the plan of God for his life. That's right. So whenever God has to impact the affairs of men, he has to find somebody. He has to find a, a, a venue or means by which to enter into that situation to impact it. And the same thing happens in our life. God knows, God sees what you're going through. Mm -hmm. God hears your prayers. God has says, I've, I've come close in order to deliver, but I'm gonna need you to initiate something that gives me access to that particular area of your life. There has to be some objective manifestation of consent to give God access into that particular area of your life. Now, God wants to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, he has the power to do it, but he has to find some body to do it. He even, I mean, that's true even with Jesus. He had to use a body. Jesus had to come in an earthen vessel to be able to follow the plan that God had for man to even have salvation. He couldn't just come to earth as a spirit. He had to use an earthen body. And this is a, and this is a, this is a principle that even the enemy uh, right. uses because it is a law that only human beings have authority in the earth. The enemy has to follow the same principle because he's because he's a spirit as well. Um, they have to find some body to yield to their influence mm -hmm. in order to manifest their will. 
Wherever you're at right now, the Bible says that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses That's right. that you can't see, um, good and bad, mm -hmm. uh, good and evil. They have no way, you have, we have no way of discerning their presence until they find somebody. That's right. That will yield their members to be utilized by that spirit, to be moved or influenced by that spirit, to cause us to recognize their presence. That's right. And that law is a law that's found within the kingdom. If God's going to do anything within his kingdom, he has to find somebody to do it. Hi, I'm Dr. J.C. Matthews. And I'm co-pastor Gina Matthews. And we want to thank you for joining us here at the embassy. And we will see you next week.